Thank you ever so much. And also I want to say that Arturo's presentation about the Scikit Learn MOOC is a bright example of the overall uh, message that I want to share with you today. And as Peter said, uh, instead of sharing um, my screen, I have um, the slides here in my camera feed. So shout if you don't see them. The title of my talk is Teaching in the Open, and it summarizes um, my points of view over several years of um, uh, using what I have learned about open source communities in my teaching. And I want to propose to you that adopting open source ethos and practices can improve quality and outcomes in education. And um, this comes from several years. I have uh, uh, more than 15 years of teaching experience in the US and the UK. Uh, I'm currently at the George Washington University, uh, previously at Boston University, where all of my courses produce some um, OER, that is the acronym for Open Educational Resources that we use. And I shared uh, these in the, what was um, uh, popular at the time, iTunes U, um, then started using YouTube, TED-Ed, and various uh, platforms that were uh, popping up at the time, then moved um, to GitHub, and uh, also had a, still have a self-hosted open edX site, and I've disseminated all this activity on Twitter and, and my, my online presence. And um, all of this time, I have engaged against all recommendations, of course, as a tenure track professor in educational innovation and have dedicated a lot of effort to develop my effectiveness as a teacher and, and, and having a scholarly approach uh, uh, to, to teaching. And um, this is a playlist on YouTube. Uh, for my computational fluid dynamics videos uh, that I recorded at uh, teaching that class at Boston University. And I checked uh, just recently that they have uh, more than a million added views. Um, and, you know, this is just uh, self-produced uh, materials without any of the marketing um, um, support of the university or any institution. So I am quite happy with that. And uh, I think one of my uh, uh, proud uh, outcomes uh, in this effort is, um, uh, some people call it the 12 steps to have your talks <laughs> because it divides uh, the whole uh, solution process of getting um, uh, to a computational fluid dynamics solver uh, in 12 steps, uh, also known as CFD Python, which is a set of Jupyter notebooks that are based on a practical module that I used in the classroom in my computational fluid dynamics class at Boston University. And this collection of lessons um, uh, was widely commented on various online discussion forums and within the Python community. And, uh, and, and to this day, I hear from students all over the world um, uh, on Twitter or by email that they have um, benefited from, from their uh, open publication online. I also uh, set up an open edX platform. Open edX is the underlying uh, platform that the edX consortium uses, and it was made open source in 2012 uh, when Stanford at the time came into the MIT uh, Harvard consortium for the, what was then the nonprofit edX.org. Uh, and um, uh, being aware that this was an open source platform, I was interested in the idea of a faculty-led um, uh, MOOC uh, um, pilot, which is what I did in 2014. Uh, the course itself was called Practical Numerical Methods with Python, and it opened in 2014 in its first run. Over the first three years, we had more than 8,000 people uh, join. And um, uh, in 2017, I uh, deployed a new version of the platform and started it over again. It's still live uh, just as a um, uh, uh, self-paced course. The main messages that I want to share with you today are 
uh, here at the front, in case you tune out, uh, the idea that the open education movement was originally inspired by free and open source software, but a lot of features were missed, which I think we can bring back to make the open ed movement more powerful. The ideas of open development, the ideas of network collaboration and community, and this value-based framework that we have that make open source communities so successful. And my proposal is uh, to think about whether open source ethics and practices can enhance quality and outcomes in education. So just a little bit of history to place this in context. The open ed movement goes back to the 90s. Um, so I wanna share you the history of open educational resources. In 94, we already have this conversation about uh, learning objects. This term is used in education um, in higher ed circles all the time today. The idea that digital materials that you create for teaching can be made to be reused. Um, in 98, people were talking about open content, the ideas that you could apply principles of free and open source software to the content that is created for teaching. And uh, in 2001, you know, just over 20 years ago was the founding of Creative Commons. The Creative Commons was an out, you know, was connected to the open education movement and was created to provide uh, the licensing options for making uh, open content, for making these learning objects shareable uh, under open licenses, standard licenses. And at that time, also MIT OpenCourseWare was launched. Then in 2002, uh, UNESCO coined the term open educational resources, which we use until now. And there was a lot of movement towards open courseware, Rice University, Johns Hopkins, Tufts, and various others had efforts to create open courseware. They created a consortium, the Open Courseware Consortium. And, and there were various efforts at uh, sort of international levels um, uh, for uh, supporting open education, um, uh, the uh, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development issued a report from a long study that was titled Given Knowledge for Free, uh, the Emergence of Open Educational Resources. That was in 2007. Um, the recurring topics in open ed educational resources are reducing the cost of textbooks for students because these are very substantial costs for students in university, increasing access for worldwide learnings, all of these conversations about copyright and licenses and an overall theme of altruism and public good. Um, now, when we talk about cost, uh, we have to remember that producing open educational resources still has a cost. There was an estimate uh, based on MIT, the MIT Open Courseware annual budgets um, included in the uh, report that I just mentioned in, in the previous slide, 2007 OECD report that talked about 4 million per year. That was several years ago. Um, uh, with at the time only over 400 courses, that's about $10,000 per course. So the issue at the forefront is the cost for students. And the reason, of course, uh, for this conversation is the high cost of textbooks. And uh, this um, brings me to, again, the point of what OER, Open Educational Resources, miss from uh, open source software, the idea of developing in the open, the idea of collaborating and contributing, community around the projects, and the culture and ethos of open source. Um, and why is this important to notice that it was missed? Because the OER, Open Educational Resources Narrative, was all about creation versus adoption, the author versus the user. Um, and uh, MIT OpenCourseWare, for example, was never open for contributions. Uh, another important project, Rice's Connections, which originally was intended to be open for contributions, really did not uh, have this feature over time. And, um, you know, although Creative Commons licenses are really meant for reuse and remixing, the practice uh, in this uh, movement has always been on sharing for reuse as is, right? Uh, MIT faculty create their course materials and deposited them for free access. Users cannot become contributors. Um, and uh, this is a snapshot of um, the OpenStax project. This has a solid collection of texts for high enrollment introductory college courses. They are free to read online and very low cost to purchase. 
Um, and, uh, you know, some blog posts talked about reordering sections of the book. Um, if you're a professor that wants to change how a course is taught, but really, um, uh, revising books is not a, a, a true option that the, the, the workflow only allowed for revising when, you know, pedagogically necessary to do so. And you can submit errata, but, you know, they had to be reviewed by subject matter experts and so on. So the model is clearly a traditional authored centered one. Um, and so this leads us to a problem uh, in, in a talk. Uh, on the role of women educational resources, um, Stephen Downs, who is a noted a philosopher uh, in Canada, uh, he said that we create huge amounts of OER, but, re but there is very little reuse. He says that the people who benefit the most from OER, open educational resources, are those who create them. So the thing is, we can't really produce knowledge for people, and that's why OER are not transformative. The only sustainable OER are produced by the learners themselves, says Stephen Down. Um, and here is uh, another quote that really hits uh, the nail on the head. This is a, from a recent short video discussing the importance of openness and the role it plays in knowledge, communication, and learning. Stephen Down says this, openness is about the possibilities of communicating with other people. It's not about stuff, what you do with stuff. It's about what you do with each other. And he's hinting here at a key social interactions that make learning meaningful for all of us. So this brings me to the idea of teaching in the open. Uh, of course, in the open source software communities, we, we develop in the open, we use GitHub and all the collaborative tools uh, around this. Uh, I wanna highlight uh, open book that we created on a book sprint with some like-minded folks. Um, called Jupiter for Teaching. Jupiter, of course, is one of my favorite tools for creating educational materials in this day and age. And um, uh, what we uh, are advocating is always that we create these uh, learning objects to publish them, and they are made to be reused. And um, it, one important um, concept here is if they're meant to be reused, they have to be a uh, come with an open source license. And um, it's really open source licenses that are an incredible innovation because they allow people to coordinate the work freely within the confines of copyright law, but we make access and wide distribution a priority. And here, coordinate is a key word. We coordinate our work in a network of collaborators. And this coordination in this coordination technology really plays a crucial role and um, both in open education as it does in open source software uh, the idea that people can coordinate their actions through online platforms meaning we can improve our communication and we can work more effectively together open source culture has more to offer um, uh, than uh, just the licensing model. Um, it, it, it has this idea of uh, productive uh, freedom uh, to collaborate. And it also has embedded rituals of collaboration that allow groups of people to create tremendous value together. So for example, if you know uh, we engage in um, uh, creating forks and making changes and delivering a, a pull request, um, um, there is a coordination that everybody knows how to behave in and like a dance move of how to act to produce to take that into improving the materials whether it be by accepting the pull request or asking for changes to the pull request or reject the pull request saying why it may perhaps does not abide by style guides or, or various other um, um, community policies. When we have GitHub issues and we use them constructively over time, the idea is that the project improves in quality. So why do we care about this? Why open education is important? And here, um, I like to look at this from the point of connectivism, connectivism as a learning um, science, learning science perspective, um, the network-based pedagogy, um, which explains that uh, 
open teaching and learning practices actively promote rich networks and lively communities and fertile connections. And this leads to improved learning. That's the pedagogy of openness. So openness serves a pedagogical purpose. A learning is richer by open sharing. And there's value in this coordination. The model of open source culture is that we create value together, fostering innovation and leadership. And so it's important to think about openness in education, serving this purpose. Um, the view that knowledge is created by interacting individuals in a personal learning network, learning by forming connections between concepts and people, actions, objects. This is made rich, richer by open, open sharing, especially when learners are creating derivative works and sharing these as well. So open source software communities have really shown us how the coordinated labor of many sharing their products freely produces this the great advances in technology. Uh, Scikit-learn is ex an exact uh, example of this. Over many years, uh, many coordinated their labor, creating a technology that can uh, empower a whole community to be more productive. So incorporating open source culture into education has this added bonus of building skills for effectively working in teams and promoting leadership, in my opinion. So I told you about this self-produced in the uh, MOOC, Massive Open uh, Online Course. And when I developed this idea in the summer of 2014, one of its key design features was that it was meant from the start to be a collaboration. I had three other instructors in other parts of the world that uh, I discussed the plans uh, with, and they agreed to contribute to the materials, and they were going to teach a course at their university that was going to be aligned um, with this uh, new syllabus and new set of contents we created. The materials were all written on GitHub, open in an open development process. And we used open source methods to receive reviews, suggestions, and sometimes contributions. And as open source projects go, it has a decent following. Uh, GitHub reports that the repository has 22 contributors. Uh, you don't see there because my camera is on top, but 760 something uh, stars, um, 1.5K forks, and you know, for a um, first year graduate course in um, engineering computations, uh, I think that's pretty good without having you know any uh, marketing support from any institutions. It's just a grassroots effort. Um, and of course, the main uh, contributors out of the 22 are myself and my co-author graduate students, of course, but other instructors have made contributions over time. And um, Jupiter is a big part of um, my educational practice, as we saw from Arturo's presentation, is integral to the Scikit-Learn MOOC as well, and now many um, uh, teaching uh, courses, and textbooks uh, come with a set of Jupyter notebooks uh, to go along with it. So it's an incredible uh, technology. And um, I've pulled out this uh, tweet from my friend Katie Huff from uh, my 2014 SciPy keynote. It's, it's a long time ago when they were still called IPython notebooks. And I uh, stated in my keynote that they're the killer app for teaching in science and engineering. And um, I, think it turned out to be true. I still think it's true uh, some years later and uh, many, many uh, people in the community are, are uh, agreeing, I think right now. So this is a killer app for teaching in my opinion, at least in STEM subjects, but it also, it also is a new genre of open educational resources. Um, this broad collaboration that develops all of these wonderful open source tools for interactive computing uh, include a lot of educators and uh, many of them have started creating um, uh, open educational resources uh, using Jupyter. I, I, of course, started with my CFD Python course in 2013, and uh, now I've written every course that I teach at my university since then uh, based on Jupyter. And uh, because of that experience, I developed this idea that there's a great power in computable content, that is educational content that is powerfully interactive with compute engines that are present and um, active in the learning platform. So there's a, this idea that you can create narratives with uh, all of the multimedia and 
text content um, that, that we, we are used to um, when writing a textbook, say, but making it uh, interactive and having computation as part of the narrative is incredibly uh, powerful when we're using computing, when using um, uh, the interaction to bring insights about the um, technical concepts that we're trying to teach. And one of the wonderful uh, recent examples of this, of course, is the uh, uh, Berkeley's data science curriculum. And I, uh, this, this is an article uh, that was published um, already a few years back, maybe four years back telling about the uh, uh, how Jupiter enabled the, Ber the Berkeley Data Science curriculum, how Jupiter enabled their project to scale and to serve a student-centered design, not a content-centered design, a student-centered design. The university also provides cloud Jupiter servers, so every student can get hands-on experience computing right away. These are freshman students, mind you, of all majors. And um, uh, Subjects like data science are uh, being uh, presented to, to, to all students now, creating citizens that are informed on, about technologies that are now uh, infused in all aspects of our life. Um, uh, I, I've been using, as I said, Jupiter since 2013, but uh, now it, it really has exploded. Uh, in use, and especially as uh, Berkeley has disseminated all their experience in the, their data science foundations in data science, or uh, also known as data eight uh, courses. Um, I uh, also started in um, uh, a few years back, just I think 20, um, nine to 2019, I believe, uh, a set of uh, new uh, uh, courses that I teach at my university, George Washington University, but they're, they're developed with the same format, this Jupyter-based. All of the materials are written uh, as um, in the open, but there are also some other features that are injected to make this easier to be adopted by other instructors to make reuse easier. And we apply the same type of design uh, features that we use in software, modular, design. So chunking things up into smaller modules that other instructors can adopt without uh, changing their whole course. Perhaps they can adopt in a few weeks time, um, making these modules uh, stackable in some way and sort of unbundling the course into smaller units so that in the online uh, uh, world, uh, we can uh, create a sense of um, achievement in a shorter period of time, because as we've talked about in an online format, uh, you know, this idea of a 12 or 14 week course is uh, much harder to maintain uh, the attention of your audience. And so breaking things down is, is key, modular design. Um, and I invite you to look at our GitHub org and, uh, and, and comment if you, if you wish, or adopt any of these open materials, um, uh, understanding that these are not for machine learning. These are uh, foundational uh, uh, materials for freshmen engineer, uh, engineering or science students uh, across the board. But um, the imp one important aspect of all of this vision is that you can also, uh, you know, if you're building your teaching materials to be reused and you're developing in the open and you're investing this um, uh, this um, time and effort, then we also want to have an avenue for publishing um, uh, these uh, products of, of our scholarly endeavor. So uh, we created the Journal of Open Source Education for that purpose. Uh, the Journal of Open Source Education Jose is a sibling journal of the Journal of Open Source Software, which I hope you're familiar with. And um, uh, JAWS um, publishes open research software. And Jose relies on all the same design of JAWS and the same journal management infrastructure um, and all the tools developed for, for JAWS and um, uh, offers a venue to publish two types of articles that describe either open educational software tools and open 
source educational materials. Um, we originally target open educational materials in technical uh, courses or technical uh, uh, topics that particularly those that use computing embedded in the curriculum. And one of the um, vision uh, slogans we had early on is this idea of not, we just, we, we're not publishing about uh, courses that are for learning to code, but courses that use coding to learn. The idea that you can use computing as a vehicle to bring insight into um, science and engineering topics. And uh, this journal is a response to the fact that currently academia really lacks a mechanism for crediting efforts to develop either software that assists on teaching and learning. So, for example, autograders or things like that and uh, open source educational content. So uh, beyond personal motivation, there's sometimes little incentive to develop and share such material. Um, you know, open source materials such as Jupyter Notebooks or plain text markup, language documents, R Markdown, or, or any type of course or lesson content that is uh, uh, meant to be reused and is uh, ready to be adopted by others. Uh, so we think about the types of objects that can be incrementally and collaboratively improved. So that's why we focus on Jupyter Notebooks, Markdown, and that kind of content that can be version control, can be developed in the open. Uh, not suitable for this are slides or YouTube videos because you can't really contribute to a YouTube video to improve it. It's very hard to change and improve a slide and tweak it to improve it as well, a slide deck. You know, you, those are meant to be consumed as they are. Um, so that's something to keep in mind about videos, right? We sometimes use a lot of videos on MOOCs. The videos are like a static snapshot of um, what you thought was needed to be presented in a lesson at that point in time, whereas uh, open source, educational content should adopt this idea of constant uh, community improvement. Um, and we are particularly fond of those that are have some code, right, that use code to teach um, uh, in technical subjects. And from my experience over the over the this time, I have a few um, uh, ideas of kind of <laughs> key um, characteristics that one can adopt in, in these efforts. Uh, first of all, uh, like in software, we want to break complex um, uh, uh, ecosystems of ideas into smaller digestible uh, steps or chunks. Um, uh, uh, the, the idea of chunking, actually the chunking is a technical word in learning science right? <laughs> from cognitive science. Uh, it has to do with uh, the number of in, in, independent um, uh, ideas that we can keep in our working memory at one time, um, but it's used uh, in design, in learning design uh, for uh, uh, both breaking things down into smaller digestible pieces and then building up those chunks into uh, um, uh, puzzles, if you wish, of ideas coming together to form a bigger picture. Um, so when you're trying to teach something like, you know, some machine learning topic, I, I think this is very useful uh, to start with breaking things down, chunking them into a bigger picture, and then adding the narrative, adding, connecting to uh, real life at that point and authentic uh, things that connect to the learner's experience. And then linking out to the existing documentation, especially if you're using uh, tools like uh, scikit-learn, tools that are tools of the trade of this um, uh, uh, community to link out to the documentation that people are going to have to consult afterwards when they're uh, on their own uh, trying to, to, to work or develop their problem on projects. Um, it's always good to interleave as people go uh, through a, um, um, a lesson as uh, Arsuro also related from their uh, scikit-learn MOOC, interleave exercises so people can stop and um, retrieve from their memory something that they've just seen and apply it. 
always also good to spice with challenging questions for the more advanced people and to have a, a moment to uh, uh, um, make students inspired and of course publish everything openly online. And um, from the scope of Jose, I, I wanted to point out to our documentation uh, to invite you to uh, look into submitting your work. We are in a lot of need of support for reviewing as well. So uh, over the COVID times, we were uh, very slow because everybody was um, uh, a little burned out and uh, having low bandwidth for a fully volunteer effort such as this. And so if you want to um, uh, volunteer as a reviewer, reviewer pl please uh, visit our website and, and do so. We have a sign up sheet. And um, if you want to submit, uh, the scope includes two types of submission. And what we mean by ed open ed source educational materials, as I explained previously, is um, materials that can be improved and can be developed in the open, um, uh, say on GitHub or a similar platform. And uh, it does not include YouTube videos, but these can be, of course, supplementary materials to, to such um, submissions. And the software submissions usually have to do with educational technology, for example, uh, uh, auto graders, cloud system for lesson delivery and, and collaboration tools. And we've even had some uh, 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 how do you say, like web applications that, that show some uh, graphical uh, representations of uh, concepts to help students uh, learn about these as well. Um, so this is what I wanted to tell you about. I know we have more time, but I wanted to leave a lot of time for discussion. And so this is the end of my prepared remarks. Thank you.